Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body would be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Cheerful passage, huh? Matthew 5, uh, open up there in your Bibles if you've got them with you. A man named Malcolm Muggeridge was a British journalist and author in the 20th century. He came to faith later on in his life. And in his autobiography, he notes that while he was faithful to his wife for their whole marriage, he always had this belief in the back of his mind that if he had the opportunity to commit adultery, he would try it just for the experience. And this opportunity presented itself when he was doing some guest lecturing away in India, far away from his wife and his family. And every morning he would bathe in the Ganges River, if I'm saying that right. He would bathe there, and then he would go and do his teaching. One such morning, he's going into the water, and he sees there's another woman bathing in the same river. And he thought, okay, this is my chance. And so he starts to swim towards her. And as he does this, he's uh, swimming against not only the current, but his own conscience. And he hears a voice tell him, Malcolm, don't do it. And another voice says, this is your chance. It's now or never. And so he continues swimming towards her. He actually goes under the water and emerges just a few feet away from her. And it was he, not her, that experienced the shock of a lifetime. He notes that this woman had leprosy, and so her whole nose was gone. She had white blotches and boils all over her skin. She had no tips on her fingers. And the first thing he thought was, what a wretched woman she is. And immediately another thought came to his mind. He thought, what a wretched man I am. Because this poor woman with leprosy revealed to Malcolm the state of his own heart which was far more disfigured than what leprosy can do to the body. On that note, we're continuing on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is making a pivot, and he's focusing on the heart. He opens the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. He talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. God is bringing his kingdom back. The king is returning. And what's it going to look like? What is the good life in the kingdom? And so he lists, okay, blessed are these types of people. He lists out these positive characteristics. And then he uh, basically has a hinge passage where he says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. God coming and bringing his kingdom and Jesus going, uh, becoming incarnate. This isn't throwing everything out the window that God has been doing for the last several thousand years. It's actually completing it. He's not turning things upside down. He's turning the law upside right. And he gives examples and he starts going through the Ten Commandments. And so two weeks ago, Pastor Minsu shared about where Jesus talks about anger. He says, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, if anyone has hatred in his heart, towards his brother. He's committed murder in his heart. So it's not just refraining from killing people, but if you have the same posture in your heart, then you're also far outside where God wants you to be. Jesus is describing the kingdom. You can describe it positively. This is what it's like. And you can describe it negatively. This is what it's not like. Think of the law like a fence and you don't go past here. So the fence is do not murder. But if you're like a dog, right up against the fence, just barking and screaming at people as they go by, right up there, I would kill you if this fence wasn't here. You think, that dog needs Jesus. Oh man, that dog needs help. You don't think that's a well-behaved dog if you think this fence is the only thing keeping that dog from killing me. The same with the commandments. I want to kill you, but I'm not going to because of the silly law. Jesus says, hey, that's not the state of heart that God wants you to be in, so he's calling you out of it. Now Jesus makes a beeline after anger straight to sex. 
9.45 in the morning, let's get to it. And so Jesus goes right to it. And he is neither flippant about sex, nor is he prudish about it. He doesn't hide from it. He doesn't bow to it. But he's going to acknowledge the dignity and the danger of this God-given capacity. So I'm going to read just these verses where he talks about lust and the dangers of sex. Beginning in verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. He's referencing the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than that you lose your whole body, be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. Jesus is describing the kingdom. He is the king. He's saying this is how it's supposed to work. And everything that comes under the healing hand of Jesus is changed. That could be the series summary right there. Everything that comes under the hand is healed. And so Jesus first talks to this. He talks about sexuality. He goes right to the human heart. And if you want the summary of what Jesus is going to say here, the whole biblical sexual ethic, here's the 140 characters or less. Jesus is going to say this to us today. Sex will be a window into the glories of heaven or a path of alienation from God and bondage to sin. That's what he's going to say. It will be one or the other, but it will never be just fun. It's never going to be just fun or just a good time. It will take you in one direction or it will take you in another. That's what he's going to say this way. It's not a neutral space. It's not a neutral ground. So about this topic, Jesus really is going to say two things quickly. He's going to address purity and he's going to address passion. He's going to talk about the act itself and then all of, the, all of our emotions and hormones that go around it. So Along the lines of purity itself, Jesus upholds the biblical sexual ethic, and this is it, that the proper place of sex is within the commitment and covenant of marriage. Two people for life. That's it. That's the statement right there. And we talked about this during our Joseph series with Potiphar's wife, but the Lord would have it see fit that we cover it again today. It might be worth touching on twice a year. But Jesus puts it forward as this. And let me Just say a couple things, because as soon as you say it, it, we're all thinking different things. The Bible is so perfect, and it's so balanced in its ethics when it puts it forward. It says, do not commit murder, but it'll say elsewhere, if someone is attacking your family and you're defending themselves and they die because of you defending them, well, you're not guilty of murder in that way. Or it says... um, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, be reconciled to him. But also in Romans 12, it says, hey, as much it is within your power, be at peace with all people. Proverbs says, do not answer a a fool according to his folly. So it says, yes, be at peace with all people, but if you need to make space to do that, so be it, okay? There's balances. But when it comes to adultery, when it comes to sex, there are no such qualifications. The Bible is crystal clear this thing within these parameters. And that will certainly rub us the wrong way. It's certainly not what our culture says, but the Christian tradition has held the line on this for thousands of years. Even the whole Abrahamic monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all in agreement on this. So you cannot like it, but you can't say it's not new. Which raises a question, okay, why is adultery wrong? Why is it wrong? We can say, okay, the Bible says it's wrong. These other religions agree that it's wrong. Why is adultery wrong? I'll tell you two incorrect reasons why adultery is not wrong. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest Christian minds to ever live, he said that adultery is wrong because adulterers don't want to have kids. They're not having sex in order to raise children, and that is the purpose of it. That's what Thomas Aquinas says. Emmanuel Kant, also a great Western philosopher, said that, well, when people are committing adultery, they're actually just giving way to their passions, and so they're not being ruled by right reason. They're not being rational, so they're acting kind of like animals. They're giving away to their passions. That's what Thomas Aquinas and Emmanuel Kant said, why adultery is wrong. I will tell you, both of them are incorrect. It's a bold thing to say. Because both of them have the same assumption that sex is somehow a dirty thing. Aquinas says, well, it's for procreation, and so sex is just a necessary evil. And Kant says, well, you know, passions, it's kind of part of being an animal. It's not part of being human. It's not rational. But that's not what the Bible says at all. 
You look at the wisdom literature of the Bible, and it has these incredibly pronounced and celebratory descriptions of godly sex. And our English Bibles don't know the half of it because our translators are wimps. <laughs> Maybe they want to keep their contracts with Christian bookstores. I don't know. <laughs> but in the original languages, it doesn't say hug. It doesn't say caress. It talks about the beautiful thing that was created by God and given to us in this way. But, okay, so why is it wrong? Pardon me. It's wrong because it's simply outside of how God designed it to be. If God designed it to be a tool that unites two people, it both symbolizes and enacts that the two shall become one flesh, then anything outside of that is outside of the purposes. When you are naked, you are physically vulnerable. And with that comes other types of vulnerabilities. I'll show you. here. No, I'm kidding. I'm making sure you're still with me. But it's for two people to pronounce to each other, I am 100% yours, all of me, my body, my soul, my heart, my mind, my will, and my emotions, we are now one person. So when God's word is warning us about the dangers of sex outside of these purposes, God is saying to us, Jesus is upholding, don't separate your body from your soul. Don't say to someone, I want part of you, but not all of you. I'm going to give me, I'm going to give you part of myself, but not all of myself. He's saying, don't do violence to who you are, and don't do violence to this gift that has come from God in this way. And it's important to know this as a side point, because as Christians in our culture today, we can become well known for what we stand against. This is bad, this is wrong, this is dirty, don't do it. But we can not be known for what we stand for. And I would contend that God's word presents a beautiful, full, life-giving, human, dignifying understanding of what sex is. And anything outside of that is missing the mark. That's one of the words for sin, is hamartia. It's an archery term to miss the target. So it's outside of it, and with that can come all kinds of pain, all kinds of destruction, and we can all speak to that but it's important to know what God is calling us to. And like a loving father, he is good to warn us of the dangers of this good thing in the wrong place, okay? That's the first part, purity. This is the Christian sexual ethic. Second to that, Jesus then talks about the passions. The passions, because you might be thinking, well, this is just great, Sawyer. I always felt vaguely guilty about this stuff. Now I feel very guilty. I feel very specifically guilty because my conscience has now been informed. What do I do with my passions? It's interesting to note that when Jesus is speaking here in the original language, it says, anyone who looks at a woman in order to lust, in order to lust. There's a two-part coupling there, looking in order to lust in this way. There's a motivation and there's an action that comes with it. And if you think about 21st century, secular Canada today, we only understand two ways of dealing with passions. Either you push them down or you let them out. You repress them or you act upon them in another way. And so lust is either something that you push down or you let out. And even that term lust, usually it's used to talk about sexual longing in the Bible, but it can be applied to other things as well. It's really an inordinate desire of a right thing. So you could have lust towards your job or your career. If it's a desire in a wrong place that eats you up, you can be lusting towards those things. But let me, let me just give a hard and fast distinction. Lust makes you want pleasure. Love makes you want a person. Lust makes you want women in general or men in general. Love makes you want a person in particular. Love makes you want to give more of yourself to someone. You want more union with that person. But lust is quite the opposite. So if you find yourself longing to have sex with someone that you don't want to entrust yourself to more, you don't want union with them, that can be a fast and easy way to distinguish between love and lust in this way. C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called The Four Loves. He puts it better than me. He says, we use a most unfortunate idiom when we say a lustful man prowling the streets that he wants a woman. Strictly speaking, a woman is just what he does not want. He wants pleasure for which a woman happens to be the necessary piece of apparatus. It's a means to an end. Why is lust wrong? Well, it also 
doesn't honor these people for who they are. They become a means to an end. They're not someone intrinsically valuable, bearing the image of God. Now, you could be single here today and saying, great pastor, that sounds fantastic. Um, I want to be married. And you say sex is this fantastic thing. I'm willing to accept that. But what do I do in the meantime? I have these desires. What do I do with it? Well, Jesus says this, and this applies to married people and unmarried people, that self-control is something you have to do. Doesn't mean it's on your own. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, but he becomes very dramatic. He uses hyperbole, and he says, you might have to take drastic steps to remove the things in your life that are leading you to sin. If your eye is causing you to sin, he says, pluck it out. It's better to momentarily be deprived of something than eternally be walking in a direction away from God. Here, we could draw the distinction. There's a big distinction between fasting and deprivation. There's a big difference between fasting and deprivation. Saying, okay, I am choosing not to give myself into this. Versus saying, I can't get this and I want it really, really bad. If you're fasting from food, saying, okay, I'm not going to eat today or I'm not going to eat this meal today. That's on your own choice versus I want food and I can't get it. There's a difference between saying, okay, God has said this and so I'm going to take my desires and I'm going to give them to him. I'm going to say, God, here are my desires. You know the state of my heart. I give them to you. I die to them and you do with them what you want versus saying, I really, really want to be with somebody, but I can't because I might go to hell or I might get pregnant or maybe something terrible is going to happen in this way. Jesus says, take the steps that you need to. So are there situations that lead you in this direction? Are there places? Are there people? I don't really need to give examples. They come to mind for all of us. And Jesus says, by the power of the Spirit, don't be putting yourselves into these patterns and environments that are leading you into wrongly ordered areas of our loves. Say, great, how do I do that? How do I actually do that practically? Here's three practices um, that I've seen mentioned by other pastors. The first thing, very simply, make a distinction between a thought and a fantasy. Make a distinction between a thought and a fantasy. The thought can enter your mind and you, think, you might think, I'm a terrible person, I just had this lustful thought, but there's the difference of having it versus continuing to entertain it. Martin Luther said, you can't stop birds from flying around your head, but you can stop them from making nests in your hair. So you can have the thought, and in the moment you can decide, am I going to continue entertaining this thought? Am I going to have the second look? Am I going to dwell on it? Or what else will I do in the moment? Do you take a deep breath and let it out? Do you say a quick prayer? God, I give this to you. Do you recite Philippians 4.8? Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, if anything is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay, I'm not thinking about that. Do you need to start singing a hymn? Do you need to start doing push-ups? How would God lead you in that moment? But make the distinction between a thought in a fantasy. The thought can come, you don't have to entertain it. And you remember Claire Bradley, um, she spoke here about listening prayer and how when God speaks, you've got a short amount of time to respond. I think there's similarities when it comes to fighting sin in the life of the mind as well. There needs to be an immediate response. And if that's hard, we can ask God, we come and we say, God, I'm in these moments and I feel weak, would you give me more strength? Which leads us to our second point. Make a distinction between thought and fantasy. Secondly, give your desires to God. Give your desires to him. So I can say, God, I have these desires. I give them to you. I will die to them and watch what God does to your desires. Watch them be reborn when you give them to him. They could be reborn through the provision of a spouse, praise God, or they could be reborn with God providing you a type of self-control and purity that you never thought was possible in this way. But we say, I give these to you. John Newton, uh, one of the authors of Amazing Grace, he said this, everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. We can think through that at every single level of our life. Everything that God sends me is necessary and nothing that he withholds from me is necessary. So do I believe that? That God knows that I want these things. He knows the desires of my heart. And yet in his goodness and providence, he has chosen now, who knows for how long, for the rest of your life, for a year, for a month, 
that this is not for me, and he's got something better for me, and he's trying to grow me and develop me in ways that I wouldn't have chosen voluntarily, but do I trust him? Do I trust him more than I trust myself in this moment? Everything he sends is necessary. Nothing he withholds is necessary. Finally, the third point, refuse to look at your sin except through the cross. Refuse to look at your sin except through the cross. When we talk about lust and sexual sin, there's a shame that we feel that creeps in. We can talk about anger, and it's easy to think, oh yeah, I want to be less angry, God give me peace. But when we talk about sexual sin, shame comes in. We feel dirty, we feel used, we feel isolated. And shame can cause us to withdraw from God, not press into Him. The gospel does not shame you. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is not shaming you in this way. And so how can you walk in freedom from your sexual sin? Refuse to look at your sin except through the cross. The only way to have freedom from your past is through forgiveness. So when I look at my sin, the only thing I see now is what Christ has covered. I see where I was and I see what he came to save me from. And those things are behind me, but they do not define me. The only thing I'm defined now is the person and work of Jesus Christ. I will refuse to look at my sin except through the cross. Probably for half of us here today, that's your take home. When you start wanting to lean into these areas that Christ has called you to, and that voice comes forward and says, you know what you've done. You know who you are. This isn't for you. Would you remind yourself that I will refuse to look at my sin except through the cross? That's the good news of this. That's why when Jesus tells us these things, it's not a call just to behavior modification. Oh, I want to be good enough, but I've really screwed up, so I need to work my way out of the pit, and at least if I get back to zero, then I can start getting in God's good graces. It's not that at all. No one can do this, and that's the point. That's why Christ came, to set us free from our failures, to give us his spirit so we can walk in new failure. Okay, does that make sense? Great. Let's talk about divorce. Jesus then follows this up when he's talking about lust and he's talking about rightly ordered loves. He goes on to apply this to the topic of divorce. This is not a full-fledged discussion of divorce. We're opening this can of worms. I will not fully discuss the topic of divorce here today. Jesus is talking about lust and marriage and the warnings against adultery within the place of marriage. Okay, so these are just some helpful prefaces to give. And when Jesus talks about this, He goes on to talk about it more in Matthew 19, which is where I'm going to read from. He says the same thing, but he gives some more explanation, which will be helpful for our purposes today. So Matthew 19, I'm going to read from verses 3 to 8. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? That's important. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, we can't fully understand marriage, and especially divorce, unless we understand the design of the inventor. You have to understand the design of the inventor to use anything, or else it's going to harm you. Case in point, I have a crossbow, Uh, It's powerful enough to take down a moose or a deer, though I have not done that yet, but that's my intention with owning it. And that crossbow has to be used a very particular way. Even when you're trying to pull back the drawstring, if you don't do it the right way, it can break your fingers. And when you want to operate it, you have to hold it in a certain way. You can't hold it the other way because if you use it improperly, you're going to put a hole in yourself, quite literally, okay? Marriage is like that. If marriage was designed by God and not invented by us, then it's not something we can always just walk into and have our way with, because it will lead to all kinds of pain, all kinds of destruction. If it's an institution made by God, 
then the designer might have a little bit of input in telling us what paths lead to life and what paths lead to pain and heartbreak and destruction in this way, okay? Case in point. So what did Jesus say about marriage here? First, he talked about the essence of marriage. The essence of something is what, ma- ah, you jumped the slide too soon. That was supposed to be a surprise issue. You put it back. It's okay. <laughs> You've seen it. It's fine. I should have told him. So what is the essence of marriage? What is the thing that makes it marriage? You could say, well, um, love and companionship is the essence of marriage. But that can't be it because your dog loves you. You have companionship with your dog, but you're not married to your dog. So that might be a component of marriage, but that's not what separates it from everything else. Okay, uh, the essence of marriage is procreation. It can't be that, because rabbits and rats are very good at procreating, but they're not married. So that can't be the essence of marriage as well. And as you may have seen, that the essence of marriage is a covenant. The essence of marriage is a promise. That's what separates it from other things. And a covenant is a commitment. We just heard the only way to have freedom from your past is through forgiveness. The only way to control your future and to not be controlled by your future is through a covenant. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what circumstances are be like. You don't know what your hormones are going to be like in the future. But a covenant is saying, I am promising to be like this. The purpose of a marriage, the ceremony itself, it's not so much about the present. You can say, I love you, I love you, but in a covenant you're saying, I promise to be loving to you. I promise to be caring. I promise to be tender. I promise to be faithful, no matter what may come, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, till death do us part. I am promising to do this. That is what a covenant is. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of the circumstances, this is what I'm promising to do. That is the essence of marriage. What's the purpose of it then? What's the purpose of marriage in this way? Is the purpose simply procreation? It can't be that. Is the purpose just this? It's not that. What we see Jesus say actually is, he says the purpose of marriage is friendship. The purpose of marriage is friendship. There may be other purposes, but this is what he references here in verse 5. He says, you've heard it said that in the beginning, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. That term cleave is actually what we get the word covenant from. It's that cleaving. But when God is creating everything, you see Genesis 1, 2, and 3, he's pronouncing a series of benedictions. He says, he made this and it was good. He made this, and it was good. He made this, and it was good. The night and the day, the land and the water, the animals, the birds, the fishes, it's all good. And he pronounces one malediction. He says one thing is not good. He sees that man is alone. And he saw it was not good that man should be alone. He sees a guy on his own, that's a problem. And so he makes Eve, he makes woman. And so the two can be one flesh. So they will have each other in the covenant of marriage for all of time. Okay, we really got to keep moving because we only got like 10 minutes left and I'm two pages in. So if the purpose of marriage is friendship then, in light of understanding this, the essence is a covenant and the purpose is friendship. Jesus then talks about divorce. And when he talks about it, really there's two things that we can see here. If marriage is a lifelong covenant, then divorce is nothing less than an amputation. An amputation is sometimes necessary for life. If you have been made one flesh, then the separation of that, it's no less dramatic than literally cutting off your arm. And sometimes that is necessary. Jesus talks about one of the grounds for divorce here, but it's not something that's to be taken lightly. And I'm sure no one here disagrees with that. And it's also not the first thing that we jump to. Imagine a physician or a doctor. And you come in and say, hey, my arm's sore. They say, great, get the saw, we'll chop it off. No more arm, no more problem. Be sure to rate me well online. No, they wouldn't be a doctor for long in that way. And so Jesus talks about divorce as something no less dramatic than this. I've heard from many people that a divorce feels like the death of a family member. Because in many ways it is that. It is something that is painful. And Jesus says sometimes it's necessary. And he talks about this simply... Let me give you some context, pardon me, before we get into it. 
Jesus is responding to a current controversy that was happening at the time. There were two rabbinic schools, two people that followed two different rabbis. There was Hillel and Shammai, and they were trying to debate Deuteronomy 24.1. This is the verse where Moses talks about divorce and the grounds for it, okay? Shammai was taking more of a perhaps conservative view. He was saying divorce is only under certain circumstances of grave marital offense, something like adultery. That's he was saying. Hillel took a much looser view. He said if there's any marital offense, then a husband can divorce his wife. So if you're offended, if you're not happy with it, give her the certificate and then it's all good. Okay, those are the two dominant views. So they come to Jesus and they say, Rabbi, can someone divorce their wife for any reason? Is it for any reason, like the Hillel view, or is it much more constrained? And the Jewish historian, Josephus, who's writing outside of the Bible, this isn't a biblical text, he notes in Antiquities on page 24 that the dominant view was Hillel, the Rabbi Hillel, the much looser view. And so people were divorcing their wives if they no longer liked her looks or if they didn't like her cooking, or offenses so trivial as if the wife burnt the food, then the husband would divorce her in that way. This is what Jesus is responding to. And it's really not that they're actually getting divorced because of the cooking, it's more like an excuse in that sense. People are using the covenant of marriage as a way to mistreat women, because also socioeconomically, as the woman, if you weren't married, you were in a very vulnerable position. Okay, that's all being said. They were preoccupied with the grounds for divorce. Jesus was looking at the institution of marriage itself, and he refers back to Genesis, and he says, what God has joined, let man not put apart. So divorce may sometimes be necessary, but it can never be seen as a good thing. It's a concession that is made when Jesus says, because of the hardness of hearts. He says it in that way. And the word that he uses to refer to adultery, it's the Greek word pornea. And if you look in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this is the same word that's used to refer to in the book of Hosea, Israel, and how Israel relates to God and her unfaithfulness. It's also shorthand for Leviticus 18, the whole sexual code of the Bible. But if faithfulness to a, to a person is hard, imagine what it's like for God to be faithful to us. Because we can read what Jesus says here within the context of the Sermon on the Mount and the Bible as a whole and the Gospels focus on reconciliation. The focus is on reconciliation. God is being faithful to Israel. Seems like every other book, Israel, God says, come and make a covenant with me, be joined to me, and Israel is unfaithful. And God uses the language of adulteress coming and giving her love to other places when he rightfully deserves it. And we do the same thing. We go to other things. We pour out our praise. We pour out our love. We worship the gifts instead of the creator. And we are unfaithful to him. And God calls us to be reconciled to him in this way. And so Jesus says, because of the hardness of your heart, divorce may sometimes be necessary. Because what if there is challenges in the marriage? What if there is unfaithfulness? And one spouse says, hey, I'm willing to work through this. But the other spouse, the offender, says, uh, no, I don't want to be reconciled. I'm going to continue doing my thing. So they've literally joined themselves to someone else, and they don't want to be rejoined to their spouse. If there's hardness of heart in that way, if there is an opportunity for reconciliation, that might be grounds there then, because the covenant has been broken. Doesn't mean it can't be rejoined, but if the other party does not want to, that's it. Let me just talk about the grounds for divorce in the Bible. We see a couple. The first grounds for divorce is simply death. If your spouse dies, you're no longer married to them. Does that mean I can kill my spouse? No. I know what you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> but we offer a specialized service here at the church, actually. <laughs> a very particular type of usher. Talk to Ryan at the back. <laughs> but simply death. If the spouse dies, then the covenant is no more. And then we see what Jesus says here, adultery. If the spouse has gone and joined themselves to someone else, they have broken the covenant. That may be grounds for it. That doesn't mean there can't be reconciliation. There's incredible stories of people being reconciled together. But this can be grounds for it. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about abandonment. Like if your spouse literally abandons you, if they take off and you don't know where they are and they've abandoned you in the covenant, he says, 
well, then you can be remarried in that way. And theologians and biblical interpreters have also understood abuse within this context of abandonment. If a spouse is staying physically close to you, but they are abusive in this way, they are abandoning the covenant they've given to love you. So that can be grounds for separation. There, can be, there should be first separation of sorts, and if the spouse does not want to repent, if there is a hardness of heart, if they don't want to be reconciled, that can be grounds for separation. So if you are in an abusive marriage today, Jesus is not telling you to stay in it because that's what it means to be a good Christian. That's not what it means at all. You should probably make some space, and there can be reconciliation, there can be healing, but that's a long road and God needs to do work there. That's all besides the point. But Jesus here is emphasizing that the type of people that he's describing in the Sermon on the Mount, the long-suffering, blessed are the meek, the poor of spirit, the humble, he's describing these type of people, and he's painting the picture of marriage as a lifelong commitment between two people in the image of God, then if we're trying to be like the people in the Beatitudes, wouldn't we be bent towards reconciliation? This is the picture he's painting for us here today. And I know this is hard. I know this is incredibly hard, and we're touching on a sore spot. We're touching on a lot of sore spots today. We can think about this as, okay, God, uh, this is really, really hard. This person isn't who I thought they were. I can't do this on my own. And so then that's where the problem of lust comes in. We can be tempted to look to other places for fulfillment. We can look to other ways. But Jesus is inviting us here into something that is the place where life can be found. He says, this is what it was meant to be. Two people saying to each other, I'm not going anywhere. And we can't do that. So this is another place where we come to him. And we say, God, I can't do this on my own. Can you help me? Can you help my spouse in this way? What can I do? So this isn't also really a marriage sermon, but we're already here. So what are a couple helpful things we can do in this case? When it comes to our own marriages, Jesus is encouraging us to commit, to fight the good fight. And the options before us really seem to be this. We can have uh, maintenance or we can have crisis management in our marriages. You can do upkeep or we can actually give things attention when they break down. So what's it going to be for all of us today, married or those thinking about marriage today? Maintenance or crisis management. Husbands, are there things that your wife is asking of you and you don't want to do it? Is she saying, hey, I think we need a date night every week. Hey, I'd love it if we went through a book together. Hey, I think we need counseling. And you might say, well, guess what? Uh, That sounds like a you problem. If that's what you need to do to be less miserable, sweet, but I feel fine right now. But Jesus is painting a picture of the people in the kingdom of heaven and the Beatitudes, those who are humble, those who are meek. He says, you're one flesh. So it's not just a you problem. That's literally your body. Your wife is part of yourself. And so if there's pain there, that doesn't mean you do everything your wife says, but this is something to be listened to in this way. Are we being attentive to our wives? Wives, are we listening? Are our husbands pointing out things perhaps that they would also like, hey, I would like more of this. Can we do this together? And are we listening to them or not? I'm just nervous to talk about wives because I don't understand women. So I'm just going to preach to the men, okay? I started talking and I was like, this is terribly wrong. I'm not doing that, okay? (laughs) Maintenance or crisis management. Are we the type of people that God is describing in the Beatitudes? And the answer is no. And that's why Jesus is pointing it out. He's pointing out our need for a Savior our need for the Spirit of God, the Spirit who reconciles us, the Spirit who calls out to God's people to be reconciled to Him, to have that same Spirit in our marriages, that our marriages would be a picture of God's reconciliation of all things unto the world. I heard this said by a pastor 20 years ago. He's problematic now. He wasn't then, so I won't say his name. But he said this, when love does what love did, love will feel what love felt. When love does what love did, Love will feel what love felt. So is God calling us today to take a step of reconciliation towards our spouse? He paints a beautiful picture of marriage, but he's talking about it within the context of lust, within the proper place of love itself. God is telling us, this is what brings you life, and this is what will bring pain and alienation, and what are the steps you're willing to take? Better to lose a member than to be cast into hell. Better to walk in a way of life that God has laid before us than to walk away from him and his good purposes. 
And so we see this, and by faith, every day on our knees, we ask God to bring us closer to it. And where we fall short, and where we will fall short, grace abounds. So I say, I refuse to look at my sin except through the cross. My sin will show me what Christ has set me free from. And may we also model this in our marriages today. The enemy does not want you to have a good marriage, but God does. He's highly invested in your marriage. He's inviting you to invite him into it every day. So we're not trying to be the Holy Spirit to our spouse. We're coming to God and saying, hey, where can I respond in faithfulness and where can I show your love to them? I'm not here to condemn them. I'm here to remind them of who they are and who you are today. So where is God calling you today as we study his word? Is it in greater trust? Is it in response? Are there things we need to do? Are there things we need to not do by his spirit? Are there people we need to apologize to? I would invite you to pray with me. God, we come with heavy hearts, recognizing how much we fall short. We carry baggage and shame and anger and resentment against ourselves and against others. Father, we ask today that you would remind us, renew the joy of our salvation. Remind us of the freedom that we do have, not only from our past, but in our present. That by the power of your spirit, not only do we have the power to be freed from our sin, but to walk in a newness of life that you described for us, that Jesus walked in. So today, would your spirit be encouraging us, freeing us from shame, convicting us of where we are not walking in the life you would have for us. And by your spirit, would you be giving us greater power, greater freedom, the strength to walk in these things. Even today, even as we're leaving the parking lot, Father, we pray for freedom in this place today. Would we meet you afresh? Would we have freedom from these things and the freedom to walk in the life that you've given to us. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Church, would you please stand as we respond in worship. Hey everyone, my name is Sawyer. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you were impacted by this message and you have a desire to dive deeper into a church community, I would encourage you to join us in person for our full Sunday experience. We'd love to meet you at our welcome center and get to know who you are. And here at Bayview, our desire is for everyone, everywhere, to experience God's love. So whether you are a lifelong believer or you're kind of going through a season of doubts and questioning or you're simply curious about church, you are welcome and you are loved here. Also be sure to check out our website, bayviewglen.org, for our service times and any midweek events to join. So come be part of our community here at Bayview Glen Church. Can't wait to see you.